Uncle Joe here. It's September 4, and we're here at Consum World Expo. And with me today is Dana Lombardi. Nice to have you, Dana. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Okay, and uh, you're a regular at these expos, right? I have tried to be at as many expos as I can get to. It's just great people, great gaming, and yeah, I love it. Okay, it's great. It's great to have you here. And uh, the, the expo, of course, is, is a forum where we have uh, designers come in and uh, they show their games, they play, play test their games, and I guess you've been doing that through the years too also? Yes, yes, I've been here numerous times in the past where I was showing a new game, a uh, prototype, a play test version, and yeah, the, and I, I couldn't do it this year, but I brought some handouts that describe the next game that I'm working on. Okay, so what's that next game? It's going to be in the Streets of Stalingrad series, <clears throat> but it's not going to be another monster game. The early Streets of Stalingrad, the first three editions that we published, were 2,000 counters, six foot or seven foot long boards, game mm -hmm. boards, uh, and so you had to have quite a number of people and be able to leave it up for a while. Yes. But that's not this one. Even though I call it Streets of Stalingrad, the scale is what's different. Not the research, not the battle itself, but the scale now is regimental or brigade level uh, as the main maneuver unit. Okay, and I, I'm aware because uh, I have the third edition, which is the uh, Art Lupinacci L2 edition. Is that correct? Yes, L2, Art and me. We're Lombardi Lupinacci. Oh, so Lombardi and Lupinacci. That, that, that's L2. A, okay, good. And uh, that edition, what was the scale there? It was also company scale, like the previous games. All of them were infantry, were companies, and then the platoons were the uh, armor. Mm -hmm. uh, platoons and then you'd have like batteries or field artillery battalions uh, so otherwise but mainly all the infantry the combat pioneers and everything were companies okay and now the scale will be what with a, a regimental level which means that the battalions and okay. and companies of stugs and combat pioneers and so forth are basically the support units so you have two types of units the basic maneuver unit is a regiment yes. in the German uh, um, divisions or a panzer grenadier battalion okay mm -hmm. and then on the Soviet side it's a brigade or an independent brigade or a regiment from a division okay so ev anything uh, below uh, in that case the battalion because you have panzer grenadier battalions and we'll talk why you have panzer grenadier battalions in, in, in a little while Anything below that, and that scale is, is like an asset that you can add to certain units. Yes, that is exactly correct. <clears throat> Basically, the Germans and, and every army eventually built what the United States Army in World War II called regimental combat teams. And basically that meant that the regiment was the main structure, but that they would attach whatever they felt was necessary to achieve the mission. Armor, engineers, uh, artillery, whatever they thought that regiment needed. Okay. So in that case, you as the German player, you can attach those assets to your units. Yes. Now, I know the, the, the dynamics with the Russians, that are, they're just trying to throw any, everything in there to hold on. Uh, how is the dynamics on their side? Is their, their units are also regiments? Regiment or independent brigades, okay. so equivalent size unit. Uh, yes, and they, and they have artillery, uh, but not every unit are, has artillery. They have mortars at a low level, battalion mm -hmm. level and so forth. The regiment would therefore have a certain number of mortars that okay. give them some direct, immediate su support. But they also had anti-aircraft units that were independent. They had what were called machine gun artillery battalions, which were independent units. And they had snipers, obviously. They had commissars that could be attached to help bolster the morale of a unit. So you have not as many variety and not as many types of things that the Russians can attach to their regiments or their brigades. Mm -hmm. The Germans have a lot and they can constantly be changing that every turn. The Soviets have less flexibility to do that, but they still did about the same thing. Okay. And now let's talk about the German artillery. How, how does the German artillery work in the game? So it is semi-abstracted. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't have all of the artillery battalions or regiments on the board. Instead, if you're attacking with a German regiment, for example, you then have basically disruption markers, artillery disruption markers, and you can decide how many of those you want to use with your attack. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you can also hold some back in order to do counter battery fire, uh, and you can also choose where on the board you're going to do that. Initially, the Germans can only do that of the artillery 
of their division. So let's say it's a regiment of the 71st Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. Only the 71st Infantry Division's artillery, field artillery battalions can support that attack. Mm -hmm. Eventually, within a month, the Germans formed a higher headquarters called an ARCO for their artillery, which is something they started all the way back in World War I. This is part of their doctrine. This is part of what they did. What that means is all of the division artillery, all of the independent battalions that could be attached to different units came under the control of the ARCO. And then they coordinated with the commander of the 51st Army Corps, who was running the battle in the city, and they decided how many artillery field battalions, independent battalions, and so forth would support each regiment's attack. Uh, the biggest limitation they had is they simply were at the end of a very long supply line and they didn't have enough artillery to mm -hmm. constantly shoot their guns. And so what happens is I may have, say, 30 or 40 field artillery battalions, but you can't use them every turn mm -hmm. because you have to save up your artillery supply and then do I fire it all off? Do I keep some of it back? Do I keep some of it for exploitation? So there's a, there's a game within a game in terms of how do you use your artillery, which of course was the big killer in World War I and also was the big killer in World War II. Okay, so uh, and in addition to artillery, I suppose the Germans have uh, uh, the Luftwaffe represented in the game also. Yes, that's correct. And uh, out in the open, Stukas are very deadly. Mm -hmm. uh, whether the Soviets are trying to you know, use the woods or uh, Balkas or whatever, but in the city, their uh, Chukov, who was the commander of the 62nd Soviet Army, figured out very quickly that they had to get their men as close as possible to the Germans so mm -hmm. that the Stukas could not just pound yeah. all their positions. That didn't mean the Stukas couldn't also pound positions behind, right, with a safety uh, margin, so they didn't bomb their own troops. But they, he was able to take away that extra edge in direct combat with the closing up of the gap between the forces. Literally, you could be across the street. You could have Germans in one building and Soviets in the building across the street. Too close to use uh, Stukas, because they're not that accurate. No laser-guided munitions in World yeah. War II. But it also was difficult for them to do anything other than mortars, because some of the field artillery could be way off as well, and they didn't want to hit their own men. Mm -hmm. So that helped preserve a lot of Soviets who would have been probably destroyed simply by the overwhelming artillery advantage. So, uh, so the, but the Stukas can, can still, uh, they can interdict the crossing of the Volga River, right? Yes, yeah, actually there's a lot of things interdicting it, and, and the Stukas along with just regular fighter planes machine gunning the barges and everything going across. The Soviets had to do a lot of their crossing at night mm -hmm. because the air power was so dominant. The Luftwaffe basically controlled the skies. Mm -hmm. At night, the, the female Soviet pilots, the night witches, could come out. Uh, the Soviets could do things like reconnaissance uh, at night. Uh, it was tough, but uh, the Germans basically owned the day as far as the Air Force was concerned. So at night, when they're trying to cross in barges and so forth, which is not fast, although they had some boats powered boats that would take uh, men over, and they even built an underwater bridge. And when I say underwater, I mean literally just below the surface mm -hmm. so that this footbridge was invisible, okay? Oh, Except the men could walk across this, hold the hand rolls, and go across the bridge. So they trickled in, trickled in supplies, which was critical. It wasn't just the men, the soldiers. It was also the fact ammunition, food, medical supplies, all of that had to be taken in the city, and it couldn't be done on a big, large bridge, didn't exist, and the number of Volga flotilla bolts was limited, so they couldn't just put masses of amounts of supplies and ammunition into the city. So what did the Germans do? At night, where they got reached the, the um, Volga River bank, okay, they did reach it in several places, they would put their uh, heavy machine guns, they would put down their... Um, any aircraft guns, etc. Yeah. So you had all these weapons, and they would use uh, uh, star flares, yes. where it lightened up, you know, would oh, lighten, lighten the area for a while. And the, the game starts yeah, yeah. when in, in time, in, in 1942? 
in late the fall of 1942, the Germans had reached the outskirts of the city in September of 1942. The campaign that began, the summer campaign in the South Russia area, yes. began in uh, July. Mm -hmm. and went through August and then uh, by this point the Germans are tired, the Ro Soviets are retreating like crazy, trying to avoid encirclement. Um, they're no longer hold in place. Stalin was convinced that that was a bad idea because the Germans just surrounded hundreds of thousands of Soviets in the, uh, the f 1941. So they were doing it differently. But still, they're, they're disorganized, a lot of the guys are being captured, they're quitting, um, and so their morale is down. They reached uh, close to the city in August of 1942, yeah. and then the Luftwaffe just flattened the city. It was a major industrial center. They had the tractor factory there, they had the, uh, the gun works. In other words, they did a lot of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is, is that the, once the Luftwaffe had flattened it and destroyed it, that capability was gone, okay? Mm -hmm. So the only reason to take the city was prestige, and Hitler said, take the city, okay? One of the things that's a background that's very important to remember is that uh, Paulus, who was the commander at six, of the Sixth Army, who was mm -hmm. supposed to capture the city, his boss, the, com the Army Group South commander, Brian Bikes, was not going to go against Hitler, never really directed anything, never came up with any other ideas, because Hitler fired Guderian, fired Rundstedt, fired all the field marshals and generals who he felt had disobeyed him in 1941 by retreating without his permission during this Soviet winter offensive. Mm -hmm. So all these really good generals, all these good field marshals are gone. Paulus had been like a staff officer and suddenly he's replacing the guy who basically died uh, commanding the Sixth Army from heart attack, not combat, and then the commander of the Army Group South who replaced Runestead, um, he was like, no, 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 I want to keep my job. I'm yeah. not contradicting Hitler because Quite frankly, this was one of the, this battle should never happen, never should have happened because the city is 30 kilometers long on the Volga River and there's no reason once it was destroyed yeah. to capture it, none. If the Germans, and remember this is the summer now, if they simply had crossed the river and surrounded the city, everybody in the city is going to have to surrender at some point. And they had the capability of doing that. but. Paulus was low on supplies. He, I mean, remember, this is like hundreds of miles mm -hmm. that they had gone forward, and there was no like rail lines. You can just get, hop on a train and get there. Yeah. So it would go as far forward as the train could take the supplies, and then trucks, which the German army didn't have a lot of, unlike the American army, yeah. they would bring up the supplies as best they could. Um, and sometimes they'd even use the Luftwaffe, the Ju-52s and so forth, to bring supplies up uh, just so they could keep moving forward. But they're, they basically, literally, were running out of gas by the time they got mm -hmm. to Stalingrad. And Paulus was not the kind of guy to say, hey, Adolf, here's how about, why don't we just capture the city, force them, in a few weeks they'll be over with and that'll be it. Encircle the city, yeah. Encircle the city, just encircle the city. This comes up very importantly later because the Soviets know that's the smart thing to do, okay? And something will happen during the battle that the Soviets thinking, well, this is the smart thing, therefore we're going to do this other thing. That leads to the collapse of an entire area of the Soviet defense. I'll explain that in a minute. But getting back to Paulus, you know, it's like he's just moving straight forward. He's just getting his troops up there. Um, and he's not going to make suggestions. He's not imaginative enough mm -hmm. to suggest something to Hitler, whereas, of course, Manstein, Guderian, Runestead, all these guys were not afraid of telling Hitler, we need to do it this way, right? And if they can show, logically, quite often Hitler would go along with it. Uh, it was only when he got angry at them for having disobeyed his orders and the winter offensive the Soviets threw back in Mo around Moscow, mm -hmm. that's when all of a sudden everybody in the German army is like, oh no, <laughs> I am not losing my job. Because look at these guys, they won France, they won Poland, right? They won the first part of the invasion of, of you know, Soviet Union. It's like, <laughs> if they're gonna get fired, I am not gonna contradict Hitler. So to get back to this thing about what's the smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. 
The Soviets were scared to death the Germans were going to do that because they didn't. I mean, on the other opposite side of the Volga River, all they had was artillery dug in, very much like at Dien Bien Phu when the Viet, the communist Viet men were fighting the French, and they had the the French all trapped in that that valley. Yes. They still had to dig their their 105s into the side of the hills so that only the barrels were sticking out. Okay, so that. Um, that made them less vulnerable to air attacks and so forth because the French still had, Viet Minh didn't have an air force, right? So mm -hmm. the French would support their troops with air attacks and bombing, um, and that's why they protected the guns by digging in. The same thing in World War II, the Soviet artillery on what was the east bank of the Volga yes. were dug in, okay, for smart, but it also meant they weren't mobile, much difficult, mm -hmm. more difficult they to get them couldn't react out. if they're... Yeah, yeah. exactly. And also they could, could not you know, pivot, they couldn't traverse back and forth as much. It, so even though they have lots of tubes, the Russians had left artillery, they also suffered from supply problems, okay? That was starting to pinch them. Lend-Lease had not yet really kicked in in a big way, mm -hmm. and the Soviet factories had not all come online 100%. Mm -hmm. So they had to like husband their artillery supply in order to fight everywhere, and Selinger was just one location. Anyway, so the Soviets are sitting there, and they get the word that the, in October, remember the, the battle begins for the city in September. Months later, the Germans are going, you know, we gotta, we got to stop this because we're get too, losing too many people. We're only taking off little chunks of the city. So they decide to bring the 14th Panzer Division in, okay, and another infantry division. So all of a sudden, these forces come in. The Soviets know this. It's very hard to you know, disguise that. Radio intercept, prisoners, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whatever their intelligence, Soviet had great intelligence service. And the Soviets are sitting there going, you know, they're bringing this, this group in to hop across the river. That's a smart thing. Hop across the river, <laughs> cut off our guys in Stalingrad, right? And what we need to do is we need to preserve this artillery because once they hop across the river, we can't move it out quickly. And it's not going to be pointed at the, at the Germans who have crossed the river. So they removed the guns. They literally, it was like a guessing game. Where are the Germans coming? That's the smart move. Remove all the guns. So when the Germans finally attacked in the city mm -hmm. with the 14th Panzer and the other uh, you know, division, um, there was no artillery support for Chukov. There's no artillery support for the 62nd Army for days because it took that long to move the guns back. The Germans used that opportunity to break through a section of the city all the way to the Volga bank behind the tractor factory, isolated the 37th Guards Division, and boom, gone. So they chopped off half of the, the Germans chopped off half of the Soviet defensive area just by doing that because the Soviets removed the cannon. So the Soviets overestimated the Germans. Yeah, they actually gave the Germans more credit for thinking correctly than uh, the, actually the Germans actually did. Now, in the game, you don't have to do that, okay? Yeah, and, and as the Germans, you can go, you know, you know, going up against all these city stuff all the time is not the smartest thing. So you can choose to try and go across the river, okay? Mm -hmm. So that way, it keeps the Soviet player honest. Because if you know the Germans aren't coming across the river, why would you remove all the artillery, right? Yeah. But if you know there's a possibility, do you remove some of the artillery? Do you remove all the artillery? The German has the initiative. The attacker has the initiative. Mm -hmm. And there's something else related to this people don't realize. The 62nd Army was destroyed three times. 150,000 casualties. Uh, and a, a rifle army had about 50,000 men in it. Huh. So during this, from September, October, November, two months when the Germans were attacking the city, the 62nd Army has fed in massive numbers yeah. of whatever they could get in, brigades, divisions, independent companies, whatever they could get in there to try and hold the city or at least so, slow down the Germans. And the Germans, every time they wanted to take a piece of the city, they did so. Okay, it was costly. It was absolutely costly to the Germans, but the Soviets just were thrown in as much as they could to wear down the Germans, keep them focused on fighting in the city while they built up the areas around the city for their big counterattack. Yes. Okay. Anyway, so 
one of the things people don't realize is that fighting in a city is, is more costly for a defender. And you wonder, wait a minute, isn't the terrain benefiting the defender? Yeah, one would think that. Yeah. That's, that's the logic. But here's the problem with that. Out in the open, the open terrain, or if you're in woods, you can see a lot farther. I can see hundreds of yards, probably you know a couple thousand. I can see as much as a couple of kilometers, right? Mm -hmm. Just sit there, call in the artillery, have and a battalion or regimental front has to have a, a larger uh, footprint, right? Mm -hmm. so it might cover yeah. a half a clip or a click, right? A Whereas yeah. in the city, what are the distances? This street, this building, okay? And if you don't cover every street, then the other side, the attackers can get behind you. So the frontage is smaller than in open terrain. And what does that mean? You need more men, more to cover, physically. More but space. if you pack more men oh. into a smaller space, what happens when a 105 or 155 round hits a building packed with 100 men, right? Mm -hmm. Massive casualties, you know? Mm -hmm. So what happened is that the Soviets had no choice but to occupy every street, occupy every building. Now, they couldn't. They couldn't, though. They didn't have enough men. Despite the flood of, uh, you know, reinforcements mm -hmm. that they received, they could not cover every street, every building, right? And eventually the Germans would be able to take it, get behind them. Then the, the Soviets would scramble to form a new defensive line. But one of the reasons they got that time is because their artillery often would flatten. They know that they'd lost this area, this, these several blocks, and their artillery on the other side would hit those buildings that they used to occupy because they know the Germans have them now. That slowed down the Germans who didn't want to walk through a uh, bombardment. But what happened in October? There's no artillery. So the Germans not only got, you know, break through the initial crust, break through the second line, and then, oh my God, there's nobody behind them, literally. And so they just drove their panzers down to the riverbank, made a left turn, and went through the riverbank and the buildings along the side uh, and trapped the 37th guards inside the uh, uh, tractor factory. Okay. So in the game, do you, you have the opportunity as the Germans to encircle the city. And, uh, and if you want to play it like uh, historically, you can you know, throw everything in the city, right? You, you can want. do that. So, and the Soviets have to be prepared for, for either of, right? Yes, the only thing we don't let them do is totally forget the city. I mean, initially, we're not going to make it possible for you to not go in the city, okay? Hitler's orders yeah. are Hitler's orders. If you get fired, the game's over, okay? Oh, yeah. So you, yeah. have to, you have to do this within <laughs> yeah. the context of what you have. Yeah, you can't leave a skeleton force in the city. No, you, you can't do that. You can't just abandon it. On a very big strategic level, if you want to play a game like that, you can. Yeah. But, you know, for the game, you can't have a game of a city showing the entire city and then say you, you don't have to fight in the city. <laughs> What's the point, right? <laughs> but it does allow you that flexibility for that point. When the, when the Soviets were scared about this, um, we're going to allow the Germans to have that as a possibility. Maybe Paulus sells Hitler on it. Maybe, I mean, if somebody who had been a die-hard Nazi, okay, because mm -hmm. uh, Paulus wasn't, but if maybe he had appointed somebody uh, that was, uh, you know, pro-Nazi. Like a model as, or something. Uh, yeah, like a model, right? Well, what happens yeah. then is... Uh, these guys were smart because they do it knowing that Hitler would give them slack, right? Because success is the reward, right? Mm -hmm. So if Modell had been there commanding the 6th Army, he could have gone, hop across the river, isolate them. My Fuhrer, great news, we've captured the city. That's all you tell them, right? Don't right. tell them how. <laughs> so, but that's, that is a historical alternative. Yeah. That's not what the game can show. You're still Paulus, you're limited in what you can do, but the Soviets don't know that you can't go across. So we allow that possibility so that the Soviets have to figure out, do I remove my cannon or do I leave him in place? Because then you have a bigger disaster if the encirclement happens. Okay. Now this particular game, it has, uh, does it have hexes like the others? It has a mix of hexes and areas. Okay. Inside the city are your standard hexes, mm -hmm. except big enough, I have oversized counters. I have oversized counter. Right now we're looking at three quarters inch for the regiments, maybe one inch counters. Wow. So it'll be a big hex nice. in the city and the, tr and the factories, okay? okay? But outside, where the, where the few buildings are and the hills and the, and the woods and, and literally open step, you don't need hexes. 
Because remember, I said that a unit, a regiment, can hold a bigger area. Yeah. So what you would see is butt up against this hexagon grid mm -hmm. are these areas, irregular areas, that yes. incorporate these outer areas so that a regiment outside the city or a brigade would hold, say, a two or three inch horizontal shaped area. Okay? okay. Once they get to the city, now they can only control yeah. a much smaller area. Which reflects what you were talking about, the density of, of the city that requires more manpower to control each uh, its measure of terrain. Absolutely. Okay. To, to hold a city, to try and hold a city like Berlin or Leningrad or Stalingrad takes a huge number of soldiers. Fighting in an urban area just gobbles up troops. The attacker has the advantage in that they don't have to have every street covered, except for a couple of people just making sure the other side doesn't come down it, because mm -hmm. the other side's not going to attack. So the Germans have the initiative. They can pick and choose where they're going to attack, um, and they just need to make sure they don't have a giant hole that the Soviets can okay. get behind them. Uh, the Soviets, on a very tactical level, could sneak behind the Germans through sewers, through buildings that uh, they get through at night, um, you know, not everybody can be vigilant every night 100%. Yeah. So they were able to capture prisoners, they were able to go behind the Germans, which caused problems. But it wasn't like they had a massive counterattack in the city until their big winter counteroffensive happened. Okay. And um, what, what's the time scale that you use for each turn? Three, three days, okay. so that what you can do, you can fight the whole campaign in like th um, 30, 30 turns. Okay. okay, and you're going to have shorter scenarios, I suppose. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, in fact, I, I'm trying to do this like John Hill did with Squad Leader. Remember, there was the initial oh, program instruction. programmed instructions. So that's what great. I'm going to do is, I would like to have like one scenario that's just a piece of the city, few divisions on the German side, some remnants and and brigades on the Soviet side, um, and you learn how to play the game that way, mm -hmm. and then then you can get, do the full campaign later. Okay, you said, and you said that the, you're, you're thinking about counters which are three fourths of an inch, and the smaller ones are five eighths of an inch. So how how big is the map? Is, is the map going to be approximately? Well, I, I'm the, the the whole city is like uh, 30 kilometers, as I said. And when I did this uh, with my 300 meter hexes for companies, I'm looking at at least a kilometer per hex for the new map, which is so. Therefore, that six foot comes down to about two feet. Okay. Say two and a half feet long. Long. It's okay, long, long and skinny. Long and long. skinny. Okay, got it. Okay. Yeah. Because there was, except for the Orlovka pocket, yeah. you know, the, the, the Germans were real close to the city. So I you see. don't, it, it's like you're, you're not going to go that far. In fact, on the first turn, the Germans can literally get into the city in several different places. Okay. Because uh, you have zones of control, okay? But what you don't have is that Germans move and one little company can stop them, okay? Yes, temporarily, <laughs> then they just, you know, it's a road bump. And, yeah. and so that it can keep moving over it into the city. And once you get in the city, because there's no zones of control, it's like, yeah, you can put a block here, and then the Germans just... Yeah, you're gonna cover all the gaps, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, real, it's a really challenging, demanding game for the Soviets in particular, but it's not a walkover for the Germans because they literally don't have enough troops. Mm. You know, and the troops they have have been weakened over months of fighting. So Dana, how does the turn structure work in the Stalingrad game? Well, the Stalingrad game works on the following basis. It's got large counters that represent regiments on the German side or a Panzer Grenadier Battalion on the Soviet side, brigades or regiments in one of their divisions. And those are what's face up. If you're going to do an attack or the Soviets are going to defend, you have to flip that counter over once you do so, it shows little soldiers on it uh, instead of a flag. And up in the corner is a symbol for a die, a four-sided die, a six-sided die, or a ten-sided die. The four-sided die is green for green troops. That's what you roll for most of the Soviets. Mm -hmm. Six-sided for veteran troops. And a ten-sided for elite units like the Soviet Guards units yes. or the Panzer Grenadier Battalions. Okay. <clears throat> Once you've got those out, you've committed it, the Germans don't have enough points to be able to break through or even push back the Russians. The only way they're going to be able to do that is by attaching the smaller units, the 5 8 inch units, mm -hmm. which they can do at that point. They can decide where they're going to basically attach support units. It might be a uh, 
Pioneer Combat Engineer Unit, mm -hmm. might be Stugs, it might be mortars, it might be uh, direct fire with their anti-aircraft guns that pull up and okay. then shoot into a building. All of these things are options. The Those Soviet, are attached right there. That they're, they're attached at that time. Okay. That way the Soviets have no idea what the Germans are going to hit with and where. Okay, That's sort of a guessing game. The Soviets, on the other hand, some of the stuff they have to have out before that point. Some of the things they can't just attach in advance, um, be, and this is not because they can't. I mean, they could. They could put uh, commissars over here. They could put any tank guns over here. But if the Germans aren't going to attack there, why did you do that? Why did you attach those, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and you actually have some units you can't just pick up and throw over to that area. So the Soviet response is going to be, I've got a small pool, small pool of units I can attach, like commissars I can get in there, um, and I also have cards I can play. In other words, the commanders on both sides, their commanders at a battalion, a regiment, or a division level, and of course, 51st Corps commander, the German von Seidlitz, who controlled the fighting in the city on the German side, or Tchukov, who controlled the 62nd Army on the Soviet side, they also have cards. Okay. But they can't put them everywhere. If the Germans attack at 10 places, Chukov doesn't have 10 cards, mm -hmm. okay? It's not going to happen that way. And neither does Son Seidlitz. If he wants to attack 10 places, he better make sure he has enough support units attached to those regiments and battalions so that he can, you know, break through or mm -hmm. force the Soviets back. Anyway, you do all that, then you roll the die, okay, for whatever the unit is, so the regiment or the brigade, Roll the die. Yes. The defender gets to roll another die, which is basically the terrain die, okay? Out and, and not open area, but balkas and woods and things like that, a four-sided die. In the city, a six-sided die, which is gray, okay? Obviously, for gray okay. city. Cool. And, or black, a ten-sided die for the factory, okay? Oh, yeah. So what the Soviet does is he adds up all these points. The point value of that, that brigade or regiment, the attached units, okay, the die roll modifier of the commissars and so forth, the cards that maybe that division commander or brigade commander has, not, that's very rare. Or Chukov decides, oh man, I, I, I can't afford to have that collapse. So I'm going to put snipers in, I'm going to put in, um, you know, another card that allows me to uh, basically try and counter what the Germans are do, doing. So now what happens is attrition happens, right? So you see if all the support units get to do it. For example, snipers could knock out a unit. How? Because they're picking off officers and key NCOs. It's not that you're killing all the guys in the German unit, mm -hmm. but it messes up their whole cohesion and their ability to move forward under control. So that German unit, that say co combat pioneer unit, is now removed and goes, it's disrupted. It goes into a disrupted box. Mm -hmm. Eventually, if you have replacement officers and everything, it moves into a pool, active pool box, which means the, the Germans can put it back into you know a future turn, okay? Doesn't happen instantly. And then once that's all done, the Germans then have, they've already committed how many uh, disruption markers, field artillery, whatever the artillery is, that they're gonna mm -hmm. pound that area of the Soviets. That's limited because even the Stukas, for example, which you can add to it, cannot attack a unit right next to the Germans because they're literally too close, you'll hit your own troops. Yes. But they can hit the guys behind. Mm -hmm. So the Soviets, is that a dummy counter behind the Soviet line? Is it an actual like counterattack force? Is it where the headquarters is? And the, and the artillery or Stukas could disrupt that, which mm -hmm. means you're not gonna get any cards for that unit because you disrupted their headquarters. Again, you may not kill the guy, but you could have made them move you yeah. could have destroyed their radios, you could certainly cut their telephone wires, and all of a sudden this guy's trying to scramble to survive, not that he's mm -hmm. out of the game permanently, but now he's in a disrupted box, okay? okay. So both sides are, tr are cutting down the ability of the other side to add points to the die rolls. Soviets, if they're defending, have two dice, right? Let's say the four-sided dice for the unit and a, a six-sided die for the city, right? Mm -hmm. So the maximum they can get is a 10. Okay. The Germans, let's say standard veteran unit, six-sided, right? Um, yeah. And so they don't have another die. They don't get another die. What they get are oh, all I the see. points in the, su in the support you units. Add assets and the cards. And, <clears throat> and the cards are played and so forth. The, some of the units give you a column shift 
on the combat results table. Okay. So if you're, let's say you're in the two table, okay, and, it's, and you have two units that can do column shifts, all of a sudden you're not on the two table, you're on the four table, okay? Mm -hmm. Now maybe the Soviets have something that can counter that, or they stopped one of those units from being in, in the in the battle. Uh, but if they didn't, then you know suddenly the, the what you've done you shifted through all these attached units the German firepower and capability to direct that against the Soviet defenders. Okay, mm, okay. so that's how a turn works: reset, start the next turn. The Soviets theoretically can counterattack, but it's on a very local level, so you're not going to have giant regimental and brigade level attacks against the Germans, except in rare circumstances where their Trikov, for example, can have a counterattack card. It's going to be not often, because remember, they have the same problems as the Germans, right? Mm -hmm. you know, okay, you can counterattack. Because they have a river on their, uh, behind them, right? Oh, they, they got a big problem, yes. <laughs> so it's better that they stay on the defensive and just try and keep countering yeah. the German attacks. Okay, so and, and about the cards, there's going to be certain things uh, they call chrome, I suppose, uh, instilled into the cards, which, as you stated, is, a, is an element of uncertainty, right? That is, that is correct. Not only what cards you get to use, because even Trukov and von Seidlitz, who had the 51st Army Corps, they don't. They can't do everything, you know. Mm -hmm. And and the guys they want to do something. It could be the guy's sick, literally, and you can't get that unit to be involved, or the, the communication is breaking down, or something. So they don't have unlimited decisions, right? So there is a certain degree of uncertainty. Um, and then there are things that you get that at random happen, like mind dogs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like mine dogs are crazy. So it was like yeah. the, the Soviets had these dogs with explosives who were trained to eat under a tractor so that they get used to going under like a German tank. Yeah. It triggers the, the bomb, bang, that's the end of the tank. The Germans learned to get rid of these dogs as fast as they saw them, but they still existed, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of the random event cards that is drawn is the Germans, if they have any Stugs or Panzers or something, all of a sudden you can have this mine dog card come up. It's not a guarantee okay. that a unit is going to, it won't destroy an entire unit, but you know, if you are the lead tank, boom, what are the other tanks going to do? It's like let's have this area cleared out by the infantry before we go and drive down the street. So that unit goes into the disruption area. Okay? Oh, it's not eliminated, it's yeah. just, it's disrupted. So the Soviets in that battle, that combat, have removed that one panzer unit. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a guessing game. There's a lot of uncertainties for both sides and they're trying to do the best they can with what they've got with the Germans having edges in tactics and number of units available, the Soviets having advantages and being able to roll a second die for the terrain. Um, and I don't want to say cat and mouse game, but I want to say um, there's enough different challenging decisions and options in each battle, not just every turn, but yeah. each battle, that uh, should make it very challenging and a fun game. Okay. And I was going to ask you, the game starts, you say, in the fall of 1942. Uh, uh, the Germans are, do they start already in in the city or they're in the outskirts of the city? Just on the outskirts of the city. Okay, so okay? it's like about September mid, mid September, yeah, mid, September okay. 13, mid-September. Um, they're just approaching the suburbs in the southern city. Yeah. Uh, there's still a couple of, there's several kilometers outside the city. Uh, and there's this pocket up in the north that the Soviets hold. Uh, not a pocket yet, but it's a, uh, an extension into the German lines uh, called Orlovka uh, that is going to be eventually eliminated. But they're going to sit there and force the Germans to waste resources eliminating the pocket. Anyway, so that's the beginning. But you literally could go all the way from one edge of the board Okay, not, it's not a wide board, it's a very narrow board, but the Germans come in on this side of the board, here's the city, and they could literally get all the way to the city in the first turn. Okay, oh. and so you, you're not going to have a company of tanks stop a German regiment with all the attachments, okay? Mm -hmm. it's, it, the Germans probably will have some losses, but they're going to be able to, it's like a road bump. It's like, you know, and the Soviets have no choice but to throw these out. But also once you get in the city, because there's no zones of control in the city, it's like the Soviets could block this area and the Germans go right around them. Mm -hmm. So it's very scary for the Russians initially. It's like very, very tense right from the get-go, first turn. Okay. And, and you can play up to what, what month? Uh? It goes to the middle of November, so it's two months, basically about 60-some days. Um, 
that's the in the three three day turns. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can yeah. play the entire campaign in like thirty turns. Or, excuse me, twenty turns. Twenty turns. It's my math bad. Anyway, so you can twenty turns. You can play the whole whole uh, campaign. Um, and the Soviet counteroffensive began in mid November. Mid -November okay, yes. and then it's all off. It's done. They're not going to yeah. do any more attacking. Um, so I'm going to have scenarios that allow you to play a short version. So you can, uh, like programmed learning that John yeah. Hill put into like Squad Leader. original Squad Leader, yeah. That's right. So you can, play a, you can play just a section of the city with very few units, but you get an idea of how, man, how the, the procedure I just explained works with building regimental combat teams, getting leaders, commissars, support, artillery support, counter battery support, all this sort of thing. You come in and then roll the dice and you find out it's obviously just killing a lot of guys. Yeah. Will the Germans take control of this part of the city and push the Soviets back? Will they break through? Will they overrun a very weakly held, like militia? Yeah. I mean, they're a road bump, okay? And no matter how many commissars you throw in, they're probably gonna just be evaporated. So the initiative stays with the Germans, um, and we have to give each side enough options, but there's no way you can change the major overall strategy. Hitler has decided you're attacking the city. You're not going around it, you're attacking the city. Well, well so that's uh, it's always, you have to factor in those, that uh, overall decision, right, by, uh, by, by, the, by the commander, because you have also Paulus is the uh, the general there. You don't have a Rommel or you don't have a Guderian, Guderian or, or yeah, all others right. that would that's kind right. of challenge Hitler or, 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 or try to get their way, right? Paulus was not very aggressive in that point, so that's also modeled in the game. That is correct. He was just a staff officer, and he's a good staff officer, okay? But he never led an army, okay? Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I don't even think he ever led a corps. It's a, there's a mindset difference and there's an ability difference in terms of so being a staff officer to run a division or a corps or an army and an army commander, okay? And and Paulus was not an army commander, not mentally, not not an attitude. And certainly once Hitler had fired all these successful generals who helped him win Poland, win France, win the first phase of Barbarossa, right? If he's willing to throw those guys out, right? It's like Nobody German officers left are going to go, oh, I'm going to defy Hitler. That's not going to happen, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep my job. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. Now, what, what stage of, of development is the game in? Okay, right now we're at the uh, building the prototype uh, playtest versions. We're going with uh, paper and paper version rather than Vassal because uh, I had several people ask about that. I have no problem with Vassal. I, I think Vassal's great. I love Vassal. But <laughs> for, for playtesting, not all the guys have access to Vassal or can do it. And so we have our playtest groups. And so the easy thing to do is to send them paper and paper versions. So we're going to do that. And that we're trying to do that and get it out there this fall. I know the, you know, it's mm -hmm. in the holiday season, mm -hmm. but there are also guys that have time over the holidays to play test and they're interested in doing this. If we get that done, that level of play testing, then the next thing in early 2022 is play balance. Okay, yeah. we want to make sure the rules work, that everything I just told you actually works and, and is interesting. And then in 2022, we're going to make sure that the scenario and the campaign game work, they're play balanced. Uh, and if so, then we're going to do the Kickstarter in early 2022. Okay, great. And you can count me in. I'll be there in that. I'll join that Kickstarter as soon as, it, as it's up. Thank you so much. I really love uh, Stalingrad games. And, and I know you're, you, that's one of your... Uh, your favorite uh, campaigns or battles in the war. I mean, you've done so much uh, in, in the old streets of Stalingrad since uh, the, the original, uh, that was the Omega or Phoenix game? Phoenix games in 1979. Uh, 1979, so. Yeah. And then there was the Nova Games version, which was two boxes, two yes. games, instead of one giant monster game. And then uh, L2, which L2. Art Lupinacci and Lombardi, yes. Lombardi Lupinacci, the L2. That's the one I have, yeah. Right. We did that in 2002. So this is going to be the fourth version of the game, but it's not going to be a monster game. Okay, so that's great too, because for, for fellows like me, we can, I can actually get to play it, uh, for example, at a convention here in, uh, in a couple of days, and that will be, that'll be fantastic. Yes. Okay. So uh, in addition to the Stalingrad game, you want to talk about some other game? Yeah, I, I have a card game. This, I've never done a card game before. This is my first card game. Mm -hmm. And I was able to convince Roger McGowan, who's 
one of the, my favorite artists, obviously. <clears throat> he's got so much art that he's done. And I said, why don't we use your artwork on World War I and put them in a card game? And Roger said, you know what, that's a great idea. Um, it's McGowan and Lombardi's The Great War. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with our Kickstarter last year in November. And uh, a lot of people are saying, OK, Dana, but where's the game, right? I made three really bad mistakes on this. Mm -hmm. The, the first was the, well, actually, this was before even those three mistakes. The kickstart, I'd made three mistakes. But my assumption was that a card game was going to be easier to do than, say, a regular board game. Because I had never, I had cards in other games, mm -hmm. but I had not had done a, just a, a card game. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I was right and I was wrong. It was easier because the, the amount of rules for this card game, then there's not really that many. I mean, it's like on one sheet of an, uh, two sides of a one sheet of paper and eight and a half eleven, okay? So you got that, you got the glossary, then examples of play, you can see how to play the game. Mm -hmm. But that side of it isn't difficult. What is difficult are the things I, I underestimated. It takes an enormous amount of play testing if the cards have a lot of different information on them. For example, this card might affect that card or that card, and maybe sometimes this card. But then you've got a card that can cancel this card or negate that or you know prevent that from happening. You have to play test all that. So all the rules are on the cards, really. Mm -hmm. And so you have to play test that thoroughly. We had, on the version of the game that we started with in the Kickstarter, we, we play tested that. So I thought, okay, we'll have this out in a couple of months. Fine tune it, blah, blah, blah. And then I made three bad decisions, total mistakes, my fault completely, on the, uh, the Kickstarter. The first was I had a lot of people ask me, Dan, we need a solo game. We need a solo version. I had never done a card game, let alone a solo version, right? And I thought, how hard could it be? It's like, you know, I promised people something, and a lot of people joined the Kickstarter because they thought, yeah, I want to have a solo version. It took a lot longer because it was like designing another card game. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And with uses, the constraints that you have to use the same components. I have to use the same cards, but it has to be a totally different game. Yeah. Okay? Mistake number one. I wasn't finished making my mistakes. I did stretch goals, which is good. People wanted to have other cards, like simple ones like you know the infantry. They wanted the Australians. They wanted the Canadians. They wanted the Americans. They wanted the Russians, right? So, OK, no problem. Got that. But then we added other cards that did different things, like sea mines, OK, and seacoast artillery. And all of a sudden, all those cards had to be play tested, OK? We had seven stretch goals. We had like another. It was uh, like 50 or 60 cards that we added to the game, and the ones that made a difference in how you play had to be play tested. Mm -hmm. So I'm building a new solo game, I, and I've never done a card game before, so I'm building a solo game, so I have to learn how to do that. I had play testing all these new cards, but wait, I have one more mistake to make, okay? <laughs> one of the stretch goals was War of the Worlds. Now, why did I choose that? That's because H.G. Wells, famous science fiction author who wrote War of the Worlds, lived during World War I, was a journalist and a columnist who visited the Western Front repeatedly. Okay? Now, before the war, he had written uh, several science fiction things, including War of the Worlds, okay? that predicted the Martians would come down and fight people who had World War I weapons. Okay, he didn't know World War One was coming, but he knew what the weapons were out there. You know, the, the dreadnoughts, the cannon, et cetera, that kind of stuff. So we decided, hey, what what we'll do is offer that as one of the stretch goals. That'll be clever. Okay, this expansion wasn't just added on to the game. All the rules for the Martian cards are totally different. So now I've I have to build a new solo game. I have to play test all these extra cards, and now I have an expansion that has to, it's not a totally new game, but it has to have, it has to work with what we've got. So I was scrambling. I was working as fast as I can. The guy's helping me doing the play testing, uh, and then we'd find another problem, but it's sort of like, uh, there's an analogy. Have you ever heard of the frog that jumps halfway to the wall? with each hop, each hop. It, never gets it, there. it never gets to the wall. <laughs> so it's like, ooh, ooh, we're almost done with the solo game. And we announced that, right? And it's like, okay, got a little bit more. We announced that. It's like, okay, that's done. 
Now this play testing on the stretch goal. So you can see that we kept getting closer and closer to finishing this. Why is that important? Because all of these sheets of paper on all these rules, expansions, and so forth, not the cards, but the rules and examples of play, facts, all that stuff that has to support the game, they were, the reason it's if affordable to publish this is because we were able to put all of these on one shot sheet of paper and go through the press much cheaper than doing eight and a half by 11 mm -hmm. and then the printer would cut them well if just one of those sheets is missing the printer can't print it so that's why we had to wait until literally everything was done mm -hmm. totally my fault i am so sorry and i apologize to everybody about this my bad you know and i will never ever do this again because um the stalingrad game is going to have a solo component okay one of the scenarios we played solid will have that but it will be done and play tested before the kickstarter mm -hmm. okay if i have bonus cards and expansions that happens later not in the kickstarter later you can get those cards to support the stalingrad later and that will help avoid hopefully any bad delays once the Stalingrad game goes on Kickstarter. And then mm -hmm. once it's out, once it's on launched, that's it. Okay, I got it. And, and so uh, with the, the World War I game, what's the status right now? Okay, I, I know some of the guys out there don't believe me. I, I you know my credibility is for shot, you know, right now, but this convention, see Consum World Expo, I love it. And one of the reasons I love it is because you can bring things here to play test. And so I was able to use the convention this whole week play testing the final things we needed to resolve in the card game. That's done. The only thing left is this weekend, Labor Day weekend, we have people proofreading it, fresh eyes. Okay. You know, every, I'm looking at the rules, I see words that aren't even there. I can't do this anymore. I need other people with fresh eyes who are volunteering to read the rules. And next week, and I know I've said this before, next week, you know, it goes to the printer. We should have everything back, the last of the printed materials. I have the dice, I have the cards, I have the boxes, I've got all that other stuff. We should have all that back this month, September, assemble the games, and then off they go. Okay. So that's, that's the hope, that's the hope. Okay, but I think at the, at the end, when you look at things from afar, at the end, the bottom line is, you know, you want the game to be uh, out when it's ready, when it's when it's a good game that it's replayable and, and it doesn't it's not a broken game so I think I, I personally I, I, I'd wait I'd be happy to wait because it's it's worth it then it's a game you're gonna enjoy you're gonna play and uh, because we see a lot of sometimes uh, companies rushing out games and then uh, trying to fix them out and with the errata and it, it becomes a mess so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that it's moving forward i'm one of those kickstarters thank you and when you thank announce a kickstarter for the stalingrad game i'll be another one another one there i i, I love uh, stalingrad games and i love your approach to the stalingrad games and i know you're very passionate about battle of stalingrad you dedicated a lot of your time as a designer to to designing and, and, and recreating that battle since uh, the 70s with the, the first edition of the streets of stalingrad and because this game is a more let's say more playable format in the sense it's a smaller map and uh it's the kind of game that fits right into uh into my cup of tea so good thank you i i am so appreciative of joe you and the other people who have been patient with me i i truly believe that if i rush this thing out or i, I send out stuff and then there are cards that don't work that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. and, and so I painted myself in a corner. I know it. I apologize for it. And I, I'm taking the heat and I deserve to. But I cannot put out a game that doesn't work. It makes no sense. Of course. Yes. So thank you very much for being patient. I oh, hope yeah. everybody feels the same way. I understand totally. And I'm sure that the gamers also will, will, will understand. I mean, that's, we want a good game at the end. That's what, what, that's what we want. That's, uh, yes. So, so uh, is there anything else you want to add? Do you? I, one of the things people have asked me is, what's next, right? I mean, okay. Stalingrad yeah. is going to continue, uh, the, the card game's going. One of the things I did over the years is I looked at games that I had published back in the 1970s oh, yeah. and 80s, um, and some of the games that came with Conflict Magazine, or in my Pouch Series games that I designed, like Dunkirk 1940, Kalkin Gull, the Japanese and the Soviets in the Mongolia, Manchuria, uh, before World War II. And I didn't want to just do an upgraded version with new graphics. That's not, you know, it's like, they don't have to do that. 
But I looked at those games and I was thinking there's a lot of new things we can do in games that I couldn't do back then. Mm -hmm. We couldn't afford to put cards in games, yeah. okay? We couldn't have weird-sided dice, all right? Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to do that for the sake of doing it, but you just yeah. heard how I'm incorporating that into, I say... I have more tools now than before. I, exactly. I have more design and development tools available to me, so I'm going back to those games and looking at, can I do a version that isn't just looking better, mm -hmm. but actually functions better, both as a game and as a historical representation of what was actually possible. And so what I'm ha hoping for the next several years is that I'm going to reprint some of these games, but bringing them up to standards today, uh, like Euro standards, for example. Yeah, yeah I see, no, that, that is, that's good. There's nothing wrong with something that is smart and beautiful at the same time, right? Exactly. I exactly. mean, I, our games are also, they're pieces of, uh, there, there's graphic art there, and you, and you don't want a, an ugly map. You know, you want to see it, but the map has to be functional. So That's there's right. a there's a fine balance between uh, uh, graphic beauty and 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 functionality. Uh, Absolutely. There's, and, and that's sometimes it's hard to strike. So no, I'm looking forward to that. I myself, I like when when I see an old game being uh, redone these days, and as you say, not just for the sake of uh, of updating the art, but also for improving the game and making it. I think that the, 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 the fine balance is making it playable, but also historically accurate. That's, some, that's, uh, that's sometimes hard to get, but it's when you get there and, and you have a, an, a simple or a solution that is very streamlined and at the same time realistic, you, you, you hit the jackpot. Yeah, absolutely. It's very gratifying because after all, as a game designer, I want people to play the games. Yeah. You know, it doesn't do any good to have a, I mean, I love collectors, I, I really do, but <laughs> but the guys who just don't ever open, don't bring the shrimp wrap, right? Yeah. It's like, sorry, I'm not making it for you. <laughs> I want people to open the box and play the game. And like you said earlier about the big giant monster game, Streets of Stalingrad, the saddest thing to me was that not that many people could play it because of the space it required, the number of people you, and, and then you have to devote so much time over weekends, can you leave it out that long? Um, so yeah, this Stalingrad is bite size, if I can mm -hmm. say that. Yeah. It's, it's possible to play a solitaire game version of it. It's possible to have an easy two player game you can play in a couple of hours. That's my goal. Am I gonna achieve that? The play testing will show. And uh, there's nothing wrong with collecting, for example, the games that I enjoy the most and I love the most, I have my uh, play copy which is bur burned to the ground, <laughs> and then I have my shrink wrap. Yeah, I understand so I that. I have both, but, but those, those are very special games, but let's hope that this next Stalingrad is one of them. Thank you, I hope so too. So thank you, Dana, for uh, this interview, and I wish you the best of success. Thank you so much. And as I always say, this is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.